So most viral videos involve like a baby panda sneezing or a Korean pop star's infectious silly dance. But in 2004, hedge fund analyst Salman Khan, this is not the Bollywood star, by the way, Salman Khan, for you Bollywood fans, this is a different Salman Khan, uh, discovered that the video tutorials he had made to explain algebra to his 12-year-old niece became unexpectedly popular on YouTube. A couple years later, he left the world of finance to found the Khan Academy, an educational organization that today provides over 3,000 free video lectures and companion exercises online. Six years and almost 200 million views later, Khan has a plan to reform the classroom, which he outlines in his new book, The One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined. He joins us now. We'll play a couple of these video excerpts in a minute. Salman Khan, welcome to WNYC. Great to be here. At what point did you transition from running the Khan Academy, creating and sharing these videos, to advocating for a major reform of the educational process? It, well, it, it was, there was never a, a, a hard line when it started, but you know, when through this whole adventure, first worked with my cousins and then the, the YouTube videos and then uh, eventually getting funding for this non-for-profit and, and building out the interactive exercises, we've been interfacing a lot with, with the, the school system. And uh, famously, the Los Altos School system, uh, District in Northern California started using us. And, and when they asked for ideas, we said, well, it, it seems like there's an opportunity here to not focus class time on lecture anymore and instead use it for interactivity. The lecture can happen at a student's own time and pace. Uh, we can go to the self-paced reality. And it, it, frankly, worked out well for all involved, and, and we started uh, experimenting with other schools. And then uh, researchers, education historians started coming up to, to me, and, and the rest of our team says, actually, there's a lot of research that backs us up. It's called mastery-based learning. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that we traditionally learn where these students are are grouped in these age-based cohorts. This is not how humans have always learned. This is the, the we've inherited this from, the, from Prussia, a, a nation that does not exist anymore. I go into a depth of that, about that in the book. Good old pressure. And, 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 and uh, it, it seemed like some of these old but proven ideas about mastery-based learning, about self-paced learning, could now be implemented in a practical way using the technology. Is this what you call Swiss cheese learning in the book? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, once again, the Prussia model it had a, a, a positive motive. It was the first time that people said, how do we educate everyone? If you go 300 years ago, only the elite got educated. And when they thought about that problem, they said, well, it's the Industrial Revolution. How do we make a lot of anything? We put them on a line. Uh, it moves at a pace. At each station, something happens. And then some of the product is good. Some of the product isn't so good. So they applied the same principles to educating children. Big, big batches of kids throw knowledge at them. Some of them will get it. Some of them won't. And what's happening with the Swiss cheese is, is as they go at that set pace, it just accumulates. And that's why you see, I think, otherwise very capable kids, they get to algebra, they get to calculus, and they, and they just hit a wall. Instead, we say, no, work at your own pace, master concepts. Once you master concepts, then, then the next concept is going to seem intuitive. As we mix European metaphors here, the Prussian model with Swiss cheese learning. <laughs> exactly. uh, but here's a small taste of what Salman Khan does. This is a clip from a video posted just last week, and I should mention it has almost 10,000 views already, and it explains probability with a Monte Carlo simulation. This is about a minute long, and it begins with a special guest. Basketball fans, listen up. It's LeBron here. I got a quick brain teaser for you. If I'm down three with 30 seconds left, is it better to take the three or is it easier to take the two and attempt to file a bad free throw shooter? and get another possession. Here's my friend Sal with the answer. That's a very, very interesting question, LeBron. Calculating the probabilities of if you were to take a three, what's the probability of tying the game and then being able to win in overtime, that can be done on paper. But the scenario where you take a two and you attempt to foul the opposing team and they might make none or one or two free throws and then you might get another possession and you take another two, that's more complicated. You could attempt to do it on paper, but instead I've written a little computer simulation here. And this type of a simulation is called a Monte Carlo simulation. And literally, it'll run the scenario. It'll do it as many times as we put in this variable over here. So we're going to set it up so we get an accurate number. We're going to do it a thousand times for each of those scenarios and see what fraction in each scenario, which fraction do we end up winning. So a sample of a Salman Khan video. Um, and if you can deconstruct yourself a little bit, other than getting people's attention by using LeBron James, what's the technique in there that makes it more user-friendly than other things? Yeah, you know, it... it 
when I started these, I, it was for my cousins, and I didn't really think about it too much. I just said, well, um, it's for my cousin. I'll just kind of do these somewhat informally, very conversationally. Uh, I, I didn't show my face because I didn't feel like I needed to. I was already tutoring my cousins, and they just heard my voice, and we could see what we were writing. And and uh, later, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people, and that's why we've tried not to diverge too much from that, that they really liked this form factor. It felt that it didn't feel like there was someone distant sitting at a, at a chalkboard or at a chalkboard saying, oh, the next step is X, Y, or Z. It felt like we were at the kitchen table together. They felt like I was a, an older brother or cousin kind of explaining these, these type of ideas. And, and so we, we try to retain that, that conversationality, the, the humanity in it, the connection uh, with, with, with the learner. Listeners, if you want to call in, uh, we can take a few phone calls for Salman Khan. And I see some people are already calling in who want to kind of do testimonials that they've been using the system. So 212-433-WNYC. If you want to talk to Salman Khan, his new book is called The One World Schoolhouse Education Reimagined. 212-433-9692. And Miguel in Queens, you're on the air. Hi, Miguel. Hi, how are you, Brian? Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Khan. I just want to let you know that uh, I understand why that video, the first video, went viral, because uh, I'm going to college at night, and I see that the professors uh, just want to go through the whole program, so they actually explain, or they just go through the class very fast, and if let's say I don't understand something, I want to... I wanted to explain again that they want they will explain one time, but then they just wanna like go over. So you so you went to class. so you went to some Salman Khan videos that dealt with the same material. Yeah, so I went uh, on the on YouTube and looked for videos so so I can understand my calculus classes, calculus one and two, and because I was able to uh, see it one and and again and again. Uh, I was able to understand and actually pass the classes. That's great, Miguel, and and I'm sure that warms your heart. No, I mean stories the stories like, like Miguel's. I mean, for for myself and the rest of our team, I mean that's what keeps us going. Um, so, are you like the Spark Notes of YouTube in a way? You know, if people are not getting it on their own, they can go and get a quick tutorial. Yeah, and, but I, I, there, there's one thing about that comparison that that I think is, is, isn't completely there, which would be the you know, whenever people think about 10-minute videos, they think, oh, maybe this is the spark notes or the cliff notes of, of mathematics. But what I always point out is we can do as many of these 10-minute videos as we want. And so we, we're not limited by 50 minutes or 90 minutes in a lecture hall. So uh, uh, what we get a lot of feedback from students are that they like that we're much more – we go into depth. We have a lot of examples. We go into the proofs, the, con the conceptual. How does it apply to the real world? So when you try to use this, not just in this way but as a model for reforming education – Part of your concept is called the flipped classroom. Explain. And it's not my concept. Actually, very few of the concepts in the book are new concepts. They're kind of reinvigorated concepts. And this is, you know, the early days when it was mainly the videos out there. I had teachers coming to me, uh, emailing me, saying, hey, look, you've already given a, an interesting lecture about probability or about calculus. Uh, why should I use my scarce class time to do this one pace kind of uh, lecture and the, the students are sitting there passively? Instead, they can watch your stuff at their own time at their own pace, and then we can use class time for something more interactive. And once again, it's not the flip idea existed before us, but what it did is what used to be homework is now classwork, problem solving, and now you have your peers and the teacher to help you. And what used to be class time, which is lectures, you get on demand, you can remediate. We think you can go even further. In the book, I go into a lot of depth how you can go much beyond even doing the flip. Such as? Well, even the flip assumes a kind of a Prussian model, that we're all going to be learning at the same pace, the same thing at the same time. As soon as you remove the one pace fits all lecture from the classroom, then you say, well, Maybe we could have two teachers in the classroom teaching tw the, twice as many students. Maybe we could have uh, maybe we could have every student learning at their own pace, breaking away from this assembly line model. Maybe we can have students start to tutor each other. Maybe this opens up time for creativity, so they can do more open-ended projects. Keith in Washington Heights calling with, I think, a little bit of skepticism about the flipped classroom. Yes, Keith. Good morning, gentlemen. I first heard about this Khan Academy in 60 Minutes, and they showed there the classroom where the kids were learning from uh, Khan Academy, and then the teacher would circulate around the room, anybody needed additional help. And don't get me wrong, I think the idea is great, and I've watched a number of your videos there. I don't think it can replace the teacher, because I'm even when you're teaching, 
your your cousin, if you're on the phone with her and talking to her directly and having interaction back and forth, when she says, I got that point, move on, or I don't have this point, repeat it, it just it, somehow it's, it, it's different. What, let me explain it better. Let me explain it differently. When I'm teaching my students, I have interaction. I, I stop after each point. Do we get it? Do we not get it? Who doesn't get it? What needs to be further explained? It, there, there's something lost when you're just doing it on, on a video. It's, it's great stuff, but it's not the same thing as having a teacher explaining it directly and having an inter- interaction with the kids. Keith, thank you. Salman? I, 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 I 100% agree with Keith. And, and, that's, and actually, that was a big point of this book, is whenever uh, co- people come up with something virtual, the assumption is, oh, this is going to compete with the physical, you know, Amazon.com versus Barnes & Nobles. And everything that we emphasize is what we're doing is a tool for students and for teachers. And what it is is it, it allows class time to be less based on a passive lecture and more of the, the things that – that, uh, that, that Keith just talked about, more of the interaction. So when my cousins were able to do the exercises on their own and the videos on their own, then when they had time with me, I didn't have to do any explaining to them or I had to just fill in the gaps that the videos didn't cover. So I 100% agree. I have young children. I do not want them to learn only from a computer. I want that to be actually a very small fraction of their learning. And, and you were talking before about a possible multi-teacher model in the classroom while they're using the vi- uh, visuals. Have you costed out what it would take financially to use this as a you know a nationally scalable model. Maybe you saw President Obama in the debate last night talking about that teacher with a 42-student classroom. We, we're already strapped, in other words. Yeah, no, we're, we're already strapped, and obviously even an extra penny is, is going to cost something. But, you know, the technology is getting cheaper every year. Uh, I don't think you even need one computer per child. You could have one computer because they're not going to be spending all the day on the computer uh, a computer's now, you know, two, three hundred dollars. You can get a a, a a new a new laptop or a tablet device. Can last four or five years. It can be shared by four or five students. It really beca- it starts becoming on the order of ten, twenty dollars a a student a year. Uh, and, and so I think it, it becomes cost competitive with textbooks, which I really think is where th- this could be uh, more of a, uh, a of a substitute, not for the teacher, but for the textbook. Now you've got people's attention because everybody wants to replace those expensive textbooks that also get updated every few years, and you have to keep buying them. So Dan in Brooklyn will have time for one more testimonial, and it'll come from Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, I just want to say as a, a neurobiologist that I really want to thank you for saving the brains of so many children because really what people don't realize is that the brain proliferates in connections and so on from the age one onward to about uh, uh, 12, 13 years old, and then it crashes, and a lot of brain cells and brain connections are lost, about 30% of them. And what you're doing is making available to children conceptual operations that will keep those uh, connections vibrant and alive. And that's the European way of teaching, so that right after high school, they go right to professional school. No wasting four years of college that make up a 12 lost years of public education. Well, is that part of your goal, right on to professional school from high school? That, that's not that's not the goal. You know, the, the goal is actually, but it, it's not not the goal either. The, the goal is to actually introduce more uh, variety into the system. You know, in the book I go into some detail. You know, this twelve years of of primary and secondary followed. You know, and you learn physics your senior year. This was dis- determined in 1892 by ten men, mainly university presidents, the committee of ten. And and w- I think it's time that we rethink this 200 year old Prussian model. It's time we rethink this 120 year old committee of ten proposition. And so. It doesn't have to be exactly what the caller is saying, but it doesn't have to be exactly what we're saying now. It can be more flexible. Salman Khan is an inspiration to many. His new book is called The One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined. And by the way, you can access all the Khan Academy materials online at khanacademy.org. Great to speak with you. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. Brian Lehrer on WNYC.